All right, guys, we're, uh, is this thing on? Are we good? Okay. Yeah, we're going to start now. Um, so this is a talk, Intro to Cryptography. It's going to be very uh, high level, because teaching this stuff is basically a math class. Um, so we'll go over some concepts. We'll talk about block ciphers in general and kind of how they work. Uh, if you want to do the specifics and like, you know, analysis of systems like this, we can talk. That's my research in law fields. I'm doing it for a few years. Um, but the challenges will be very uh, high level and you won't need intimate mathematics for it. Okay. Um, so just real quick, like what is cryptography as a definition? Um, it's mostly just how to secure messages. Uh, in the past, it kind of started with uh, we found ancient tablets from like Mesopotamia where they would change the symbols to mean different words and only like scholars knew what it said. Um, cryptography is very much used in war. So if you see like all the big stuff we ever come up with in history, it's always for war efforts. Um, so like uh, Julius Caesar in Rome came up with his own cipher. Uh, and then that pole was also used in the Roman Empire age. So what they do is they get a pole of a fixed diameter wrap a cloth around it, write their message, and then you can only read the message if you have a pole of the right diameter. Um, but you know, you don't, we don't do that today, we have computers. But besides just like sending secure messages, um, most cryptography now is for digital signaging. So literally all of blockchain, um, if you're into that, or like online verification uses some form of cryptography. Um, all authentication, so like password hash and things like that. Um, and message uh, integrity. So if we want to send a message and make sure no one messages, uh, messes with it, um, that's a pretty big thing. So like all internet traffic can be listened to. And if you have uh, a router that's between two other people's routers, you can just change any message. So how do we know that the message hasn't been tampered with on the way there? Uh, and all three of these things are very big and the government is constantly trying to break these stuff. So. If you're into that and you want government research, cryptography is like the perfect place. Um, so just some basic examples of a cipher to like kind of explain what it is. Uh, there's the Caesar cipher where you literally just take your message in English and then move it every character down so much. So like an A would go to an M, I think, and th if you're doing 13. Um, and then the substitution cipher is you just replace every character with a fixed character. So these are like some pretty basic examples, um, but they're really bad. There's a reason why we don't do these with packets or like website data or SSL certificates. Um, so a big thing with like trivial ciphers is if we look at uh, the input and the output, there's still residual data from the input. Um, and that's a big thing with secure messaging and encryption is that you wanna just make it look like random data as much as possible. So at the previous example, if we go back, um, all these things, you can see that certain characters are repeated. Um, for instance, O and Brown and Fox, it'll give out the same character, uh, which is an issue. Because that means, let me go to the next slide, that frequency in letters and in language are kept together. So in English, E is the most uh, used letter by far. Uh, and then you have like T and A and vowels. But if we were to look at ciphertext using the two previous methods, we would see that we would get other languages, or other letters, sorry, with similar frequencies. So in the Caesar cipher, if we translate E to the letter N, and then we know you do the entire Shakespeare, N will have the same frequency as the letter E, and then from there you can just guess uh, the uh, corresponding plain text character. If you go to, actually, can we go off slides for a second? I want to show a website. How do we do, how do, we do this tech man? Oh, man. So you can see people have done tools like this. It, actually, I can just say, uh, look up CyberChef if you want to like, follow along. It's this little website that like the British government made. Uh, and you can run toy ciphers on it. You can give it input, play around with like Caesar ciphers and coding. Um, and you can kind of look for things that I've said. Let me, let me write that down. Do you want to try it? Cyber chip. Do you want me to pull this? Yeah, if you can, that'd be great. Oh, uh, 
Should that be it. Looks like. Just look up Cyber Chat. Yeah. This one. Okay. And then if we choose like uh, Caesar Cipher, or they have it as rot thirteen here, and then we just do test. You can see like T will map to the same thing, and then if we look up substitution cipher. Uh, I don't know how they do substitution cipher here. It's weird. Hmm? Yeah, but basically, like you can see, like if you you can mess around with all this stuff. This just has a bunch of different uh, types of ciphers on it. Uh, you can play with it really with that. But you can see, like the frequency analysis part is going back to. So this is why we. Um, have reevaluated cryptography since the dawn of computers. So basically, pre like industrial revolution in electricity, we always use things like this. This was like common. If you look at World War II and the Enigma machine, it's basically very complicated substitution ciphers that just follow a larger algorithm than A goes to the letter C. Um, so once we start encoding data in binary too, and we have to transmit things like files and not just words, uh, we need a new type of system to encode stuff. Uh, so goals, we are going to build a cipher today. Our goals are that um, we have one shared piece of information and then only we can encrypt and decrypt uh, whatever message we want to send, okay? And we call that the key. So if you have the key, uh, you can think of it like a mailbox. I can put something in the mailbox, I can lock it, and if I have a key, I can unlock it and take it out. We want the output to be completely random in terms of the input. Uh, and that's a lot harder than it sounds without doing something that's actually random. Because we want to reverse any action we do and decrypt any message, everything has to be deterministic, but in a way that makes it look random. It should be easy to use. Um, so by that, it's a little more abstract. So there's certain methods in cryptography that can only handle so much data. If we look at like algorithms like RSA, which I'm not going to go into, they can only encrypt data um, of the length of your key. So if you want to encrypt a message that's four megabytes, your key needs to be four megabytes, which is very problematic. Um, so we want something with a fixed size key. It can encrypt any length of data uh, all at once. That's very helpful. Um, and when I say any type of data, this should be abstract binary. So we don't want to just do emails, text messages. We want to be able to send files, we need just any, any data. Um, and it needs to be fast. So if we want something that can be used over the internet for packets, say websites, if I want to go to Google, that should be almost instant in terms of speed. So a lot of, like I was saying, RSA is an option is a very slow algorithm in terms of computational speed because it does a ton of math. So we want something that works on the circuit level, is very basic. Okay, so the solution to this is block ciphers, or a similar type of ciphers. We're gonna talk about block ciphers today. So they're called block ciphers because you split the plain text up into blocks and then you encrypt one block at a time, right? Pretty uh, self-explanatory. So usually you do um, plain text in like 32 bytes at once, 64 bytes, very small chunks, and you just run through it. Um, and to simplify it, so the block cipher is this fixed function that like everyone knows on the internet, everyone has the same implementation. The only part we change out is the key, um, which again is the same length of one block of plain text. So the key is only like 32 bytes, but uh, with that shared information, it will completely randomize the input and output. Uh, and this is done through some functions we'll show in a second. Does anyone have any questions yet? You can ask more technical things. I'm going to try to be pretty broad, but. Can you repeat a little louder? Yeah, you give this just binary, and it just outputs binary, which is great. Because that means we can represent anything in binary. Um, so this is not a problem. If we go to things like RSA, um, I'm just going to keep bringing this up because it's the one I do research on. But it's a pain because everything you have to deal with is in numbers. So if I want to send a text message, 
I have to convert it to the hex, I have to convert it to the numbers, and then I have to apply multiplication to it thousands of times, and then reconvert it in binary and stuff like this. This will just deal with zeros and ones, and it's so efficient that people now make integrated chips on this that will run in like one clock cycle. So if I want to send, like, if I want to encrypt like a terabyte of data, it should only take a few minutes, which is insane in terms of standards compared to other algorithms. Um, so we are building this toy block cipher today. I made this for a CTF challenge, uh, which if you're interested in, you can play. It's very bad. So this is what I'm saying, uh, disclaimer. None of you should ever make a crypto system. That's a very bad idea. Never do anything unique in this field. Always use someone else's work because it's proven to be useful. If you ever make something that's not your own, it's most likely bad. <laughs> I can say from experience. Right. So if we go to the structure of this, we have our input plain text and our output ciphertext. We have all this, which looks very complicated. It isn't. Um, so we input our key k0 through k3. You can just assume those are anything. It's something generated on the key. So if we look at an algorithm like DES, k0 is just the first fourth of the key. Okay. Some algorithms use something more complicated, but this is basically whatever you want to do. Uh, this symbol's XOR. Does anyone not know what XOR is? Okay. XOR is um, either or binary operator. So it, it returns true if only one of your inputs is true. Okay. Um, so what we do first, we XOR the key at the top of the plain text, substitute it by either time, that's what these are, uh, we'll talk about that in a second, and then we permute. So this part is just reordering all the bits. Um, so that means that you know, the first bit doesn't always correlate with the first bit of output. We always want to shuffle it between every stage so it gets a little bit more random. So actually go back for one second. We're going to talk about this. This is the interesting part. Next. It's called the substitution, or S-box is what it's officially called, but it's a substitution step. So to change things in our plain text, Besides XORing, um, which if we didn't do anything but XOR, we would be able to find out the key very easily. We need um, some part that replaces it uh, in a way that should be randomized. So this is how we do it. But remember, this has to be deterministic. We take one byte of the current message so far. If we've already done so many rounds, it's slightly encrypted. But if this is the first round, we take the first byte, we do a lookup table, and depending on the value of the first byte, we grab and replace it with a, a new byte. And this is one to one, so all of these are unique. Um, and that's important because that means when we're reversing the encryption, this is also one to one. And we can always get what we put in. Um, does anyone know something interesting about this? Or does anyone have any ideas about what the, these values have to be very specific? Anyone know why? Okay, so this goes back to uh, the idea of being randomized. So given uh, all possible, this is not mine, but if we have every possible byte configuration, let's just work for four bits because it's easier, right? Right, one, 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 one. Um, we have all of these. Uh, if we have one byte, and we get x1, x2, x3, x4 output. We want all of these to be completely 50-50 random, depending on the input. So if the first bit is one, um, or like let's say this one's one, this one's one, that should have no effect on the probability of these being zero or one, which is a lot harder than you think. These values have to be chosen very specifically. If you randomly you know, shuffle an array and then choose from that, you'll probably get something like an 80-20 distribution, which means like, okay, if I know this bit's a zero, there's an 80% chance that these two are ones. And from there, I can reverse this pretty easily. And when I say easily, like, I'm talking two to the 30 computations, right? Cryptography is a nation state attack. So it's not something anyone could do on their personal laptop, but if a government's trying to break you, you know, trillions of brute forcing and combinations is like daily for them. Uh, we'll talk about bounds later, but the current scheme that's used uh, pretty popular, has like maybe like two to the 45 
um, attacks to break it or like to guess the key. And that on average is like the lifespan of the universe. So anyone have questions on the S box? No? Okay, next slide. Um, so the big thing we care about is if we go two slides back, um, we did this four times, right? Because if we only do it once, if we only consider this part down, that's one that's pretty easy to guess. You know, we can guess the key, we can see if this goes back to our blood test. So if we do it twice, it gets a little harder. The more rounds we do it, the harder it gets. So if we go back, almost. Um, no, no, no. Come on, stick with it. Stick with it. You said back. Uh, there. It's forward. All right. So this looks a little complicated. I'll explain what this means. But one layer is this. This is the equation we get. To solving for a single bit. Okay. If we just want the first bit of the ciphertext, we see that it equals the S box output of the first byte of plain text XOR with the first byte of the key. Right? Which is basically saying if we go back to the diagram two slides ago, if we just consider this part down, right, just here, we XOR, we take the first byte of whatever is the result, and that's our output. So if we go Two slides down. If we do two layers though, every bit of the S box that we are now computing was previously ran through an S box and permutated. So we can't tell, or we should know which bit it is, but the amount of bits that now affect that is called an avalanche effect. So by changing even one bit in any of these parameters, we'll get something completely different. So this is just the equation for two, two layers in one bit. So if you want to solve something, the, S, the SPN we showed earlier has four layers. This will take up the entire room, right, this equation, for one bit. And then you're saying your message is 256 bits on average. Um, and you can see how like this will take thousands of computations. Um, the CTF challenge I did, use that. And people were able to crack it with models running for like three hours, only after giving like 60,000 inputs and outputs. Really able to guess the key. Um, and this is a very bad model. This is not secure in any way, but it still takes forever. Does anyone have questions on this so far? Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, okay, my disclaimer, my CTF challenge. So, like I said, I gave people two to the probably like 14 inputs. But real encryption uses 2 to 45, and that's a very large number. That's like, uh, how many zeros? I don't know, like 12, 14? It's an intro list. Okay, next slide. Um, yeah, so it's really important because, like, this isn't something that's just like, you know, you, you can't have the option of encryption stuff. People are constantly, li like, listening to everything. If you think the government's not, you're naive. Um, but like even like people find uh, issues in ciphers all the time. Like this isn't like, oh, we have one algorithm and it's fine. People are constantly developing attacks. So who knows what like SHA hashing is? Like right, have people heard about SHA hashing? Like SHA two was broke, broke like a few years ago. Or like there's attacks on SHA two if it's misconfigured. Um, so like every crypto system can be good in the math, but if you implement it poorly, you're still screwed. So 2013, crime attack, uh, you, we will actually, I think we'll do, is one of the challenges. Um, people would take user input, uh, compress it, and then encrypt it and send it, right? And if I, you know, so if I have user input, and then let's say I append um, secret input. And we want to find out the secret input, right? So what they did was they took all this and they zipped it and compressed it. But the, the trick was, if I, depending on my user input, if I put something that is similar to the secret input, the zip compression will make it smaller than the original message. So by doing many, many user inputs and just like randomizing it, I can see what compresses more often, and then I can guess the secret input based off that. 
And that was a huge exploit. Basically, every file sharing um, system in 2013 was compromised, uh, and they had to patch everything. And these aren't these are like very easy patches, but people don't think about this stuff until it's too late. Um, what else do I have? Yeah, so t trusting user input and then putting like encrypting it with other stuff is always bad. Um, one of the challenges will do something like this, where you have your input and the secret inputs after that, and you'll be able to leak everything. Um, and then there's also things like if we get into more advanced block ciphers, what you'll do is you'll have your key, right? Plain text, ciphertext, key. But you'll also have um, a user specific value called an IV, which stands for initialization vector. And the IE will be XORed with the plain text beforehand. So it just gives like an extra layer of randomization. So depending on what the person inputs, it'll jumble up the attacker's message. Um, but if you reuse IVs and you send the same message to other people, um, it can lead to like information disclosures. So that was a big issue. Like uh, websites used to have session cookies where they would reuse the IV, and you know people would have roughly the same parameters. So based off my parameters, I can guess yours if it in like encrypts it something similar. Next slide. All right. So this is the first attack we're going to explore in the challenge today. Um, this is AES ECB mode. So the fun thing about block ciphers attacking them is you don't really care how they work because usually it's an implementation thing around them. So you can just treat the block cipher as a, a complete randomizer. You don't care what it does. You only care how it formats input and output. So ECB mode stands for electronic code book and that's pretty much because every block is independent of each other. Um, so if I know the key, and I say have a book of all the inputs and all the outputs, if I see an output message, I can just know the input message um, because it's one to one. So an issue with this though is that if I have very similar data, it'll all translate to the same. So this image is the image encoded in AES. And you can see, we can still see the penguin because you know all these areas that are white pixels will encode the same uh, output. All these things that are black, you know, orange, Everything encodes the same, so it doesn't do good to mask information when it's repeated. Um, but also, there's funky things with, in the challenge we're going to do, you'll have what I had, you know, like user input plus secret. And depending, because the plain text is 16 bytes at a time, depending on how long my user input is, I can shift what's encrypted with my user input. And we'll talk about that exploit in a little bit. And then the second exploit we're going to do is um, chaining block mode. So this looks a little bit more daunting. Basically what you do is you just encrypt the plain text at the same time, but before you encrypt it, you XOR it with the ciphertext of the previous block. So what this does is it adds a layer of randomization and context in the message. So if I encrypt something halfway through the message, it will not be the same if I encrypt it and it's at the start of the message. Um, which is very important because of various, like, various, it'll, it'll be a lot to get into. But we'll have this diagram and you can, you can refer to it again challenges. These are the only slides I have. Um, I'll put the challenge, actually just one more slide. Um, if you guys want to sign up for Crypto Hack, there's going to be two challenges we're going to talk about and do today. Um, so I'll give you guys a little bit to do that. The rest of this is kind of just like, whatever you want to know. We'll do the challenges. Um, a little bit more personal, I'll explain the exploits if you need help. Um, but CryptoHack is like a great place to, it's just a bunch of games, challenges, and they teach you the math behind all these different uh, exploits and stuff. Hmm? Oh wait, I never uploaded the file. Let's see. The files will be in general the Discord. Give me one second. Yeah. The files I upload in general, um, 
aren't like the challenge itself, but it's just like boiler code to interact with the API on crypto app. So you can just use those. All right. Are you done with the stream? I think we're mostly done with the stream. Let's go to the challenges now. Are you gonna like show the challenge? Yeah.